Friends, imagine having to decide how many children you need to have to inherit a fortune. It sounds like a plot from a movie, but it actually happened in real life. Let's recall the story of Charles Miller, a well-known lawyer from Toronto, whose will caused quite a shock and excitement in society. Until the very end of his life, he was known for his cynicism and peculiar sense of humor, but no one expected his will to be so extravagant. Stay with us until the end of the video, and also subscribe to our channel not to miss the next fascinating stories. The name of the wealthy lawyer Charles Vance Miller was widely known in Toronto. The only son of farmers, he excelled academically at university and later built a successful career as a lawyer, bringing him a decent income. However, he made even more money trading stocks, land, and real estate. By the end of October 1926, when Miller, sitting in his office, suddenly suffered a stroke, his fortune was estimated in hundreds of thousands of Canadian dollars. By his own admission, he had accumulated more wealth than he could spend in his lifetime. Rumors had it that Charles Miller wasn't known for his kindness during his lifetime. He was never involved in charitable activities. He was described as a rather cynical person. Everyone has their price, the lawyer joked, and the trick is just to determine it. Miller himself sometimes joked about people. Once he spent the whole day placing $1 bills on the sidewalk and watching the faces of passers-by who picked them up. From his will, a man very wealthy but with no direct heirs, much was expected. But when the notary opened the envelope, everyone was surprised. No one could have guessed that the deceased lawyer would play such tricks. To three acquaintances who hated each other desperately, he bequeathed a country house on the condition that they would live there together. Protestant priests in Toronto were bequeathed shares in a brewery if they participated in its management, and Catholic clergy, shares in a race course where races were held. But it wasn't this that shocked society. The tenth clause of the will stated, the main part of Miller's estate should be converted into cash, and after ten years, transferred to a woman from Toronto who would give birth to the most children during these years. While Toronto authorities tried to challenge the will, promising that Miller's money would go to public organizations, dozens of Canadian women entered a real race, putting their lives and health at stake. The Supreme Court of Canada also contributed to the conditions, ruling in the end that the money would not go to the state, but to those mothers who, by the end of the race, would have living, officially registered children born exclusively within legal marriage. This condition significantly complicated the lives of mothers. Mortality was high at that time, and not all born children could safely reach the set deadline. Not to mention that one could drop out of the race by losing a lawful spouse, or in the most tragic outcome for a woman. Certainly, when drafting his will, lawyer Charles Miller hardly anticipated the impact it would have on people. In the late 1920s, the Great Depression broke out, affecting not only the USA, but also Canada, and the participants, joining the stork race, as the event was called in the press, faced the impossibility of providing for, clothing, and feeding the children they already had. Very few articles are dedicated to those poor women who entered the race but couldn't cope under the circumstances. One newspaper mentions the name of Lillian Kenny, who almost dropped out of the competition because one of her babies died, eaten by rats. It's terrifying to imagine the conditions in which these children were born and lived. By 1936, about 50 families in Toronto had announced that they would officially claim the inheritance left by Miller. If a woman could give birth to a child on the day the race was announced, and then, every nine months over the next decade, she could have had 14 children. But, of course, that's not how it works in practice. Over the past decade, families have had up to 11 children, However, the court had a long task of selecting those participants who didn't commit fraud by renting children or fully complied with all the established requirements. On October 31st, 1936, at 4.30 p.m., exactly 10 years after Miller's death, the competition was closed. 32 families came to court for the first hearing on the inheritance case to claim their rights to the late lawyer's money. But after a quick review of the applications, presiding judge William Middleton excluded everyone who had fewer than nine children under 10 years of age. As a result, only six families remained. Their stories were studied very carefully. For example, during the proceedings, it was discovered that Pauline Clark should be disqualified from the race. 
She had five children with her ex-husband, from whom she separated, and then another five with another man, with whom she wasn't legally married. Nevertheless, the judge considered it unfair to completely deprive a woman who had given birth to 10 children in 10 years of her rights. After a lengthy legal process, she received compensation paid from Miller's money. Another woman, the infamous Lillian Kenny, gave birth to 11 children in 10 years, but by the time it was time to fight for the reward, three of her babies were already dead. In the end, Judge Middleton made a decision. He declared a tie between four large families, each of which had nine children over the course of 10 years. The Timleks, Nagels, Smiths, and Macklins received about 125,000 Canadian dollars per family, which is roughly equivalent to 2 million Canadian dollars today. This amount was enough to provide the families with a comfortable life, to buy large houses, cars, and pay for their children's education. Over the years, the buzz surrounding the story associated with Miller's will subsided. And it seems that no one else tried to repeat his experiment on such a scale. And how many would agree to such an experiment?